So I want to welcome everybody to our Santa Cruz County ACES Network Learning Session. Quiero darles la bienvenida a todos a, a nuestra sesión de la red de ACES del uh, Condado de Santa Cruz. Today our, and today our topic is connecting ACES, equity, and resilience. Y hoy día nuestro tema es de conectando las ACES, la equidad y la resiliencia. And my name is Nicole Young, and I'm one of the co-hosts for today and helping out with managing all of the uh, Zoom logistics. Uh, yo me llamo Nicole Young, soy una de las co-directoras de la reunión hoy día y estoy ayud ayudando con toda la logística de Zoom. And before we begin, I want to just again cover a few of the instructions about how to participate today. Um, and so again, to if you want to be able to ask a question or share a comment when it's time, you can mute and unmute yourself uh, using either the microphone icon or pressing star six on your phone. Y si usted quiere hacer alguna pregunta, uh, primeramente quiero repasar algunas de las formas de participar hoy día. Si quiere hacer una pregunta o un comentario, puede prender y apagar su micrófono utilizando el icono del micrófono o si no, presionar estrella 6 en su teléfono. And again, we are offering simultaneous interpretation today. Uh, and so to be able to listen and participate in your preferred language, You'll need to select a channel. Otra vez estamos ofreciendo la interpretación simultánea hoy día. Entonces, um, necesita usted elegir su idioma preferido. And so click the globe icon, find the globe icon and uh, select either English or Spanish. Entonces haga clic en el icono de interpretación y seleccione ya sea inglés o español. And if you select Spanish, then also mute the original audio so that you only hear the interpreter. Y si usted selecciona español, también haga clic en la barra azul que dice silenciar audio original, de modo que solo pueda oír al intérprete. Okay, and at this point, we're, we're going to switch over entirely to simultaneous interpretation. Um, so thank you, Stella, for doing the consecutive interpretation. But now everyone who wants to hear in Spanish, um, Hopefully, it's on the Spanish channel and can hear Oscar. Esperamos que todos ya estén en el canal español, los que quieren escuchar en español, y ahora le van a oír a Oscar. Okay, and then again, if you can rename yourself in the participant list so that we know what language channel you're on, uh, we would appreciate that, and we can give you instructions uh, in the chat about how to do that. And um, we are recording the main session, but not the breakout rooms, uh, because we hope to have some uh, deeper discussion in those breakouts and want people to feel like they can be candid and open with each other. Um, but we will be taking some notes and sharing kind of some general themes that came out of those breakout sessions. And again, we invite you to share your questions and comments throughout the session in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can during the session. And if we need to, we'll ask our presenters to help us uh, provide answers afterwards that we can share with everybody. And last but not least, if you want to get our attention, you can raise your hand either using the reactions button in your Zoom app, or if you're calling in on the phone, you can press star nine on the phone and that lets us know uh, that you want to get our attention. And again, just want to acknowledge that um, this session is hosted by First Five Santa Cruz County um, with the support of the Core Investment Santa Cruz County team. There are several of us on this <clears throat> call who are part of Core, and it's been planned in partnership with our county uh, public health department and our human services department, the Health Improvement Partnership, and we are very pleased to have the Center for Community Resilience and their Building Community Resilience Partners uh, joining us again today. This is their third time coming back uh, to be with us. So thank you for that. We'll introduce them more in a moment. Um, but for now, I want to go ahead and turn it over to David Brody. Oh, sorry. Before we do that, <laughs> forgot the introductions. Um, some of you I can see have already started introducing yourselves in the chat. So go ahead and, and take a moment, everybody else, to share your name and tell us what group or organization you're with and 
what county or even state you're from, because we know we have some people that are from outside Santa Cruz County. So go ahead and introduce yourselves and then uh, David will be up next. All right, good to go. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm also really pleased to see so many of you joining us today uh, for this important discussion uh, about connecting ACEs, equity, and resilience. Um, yeah, it looks like we have 121 participants on and I bet more are still coming, so that's fantastic. Um, if you attended any of our previous sessions, you'll recall that these gatherings are part of a statewide ACEs Aware initiative led by our California's Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who was also recently appointed uh, as the chair of our First Five California Commission, our sister statewide commission in the First Five Network, uh, as well as Dr. Karen Mark of the Department of Healthcare Services. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Burke Harris, uh, as many of you may know, has set a really bold, uh, and audacious goal, an appropriately audacious goal of reducing adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, uh, which we know uh, include abuse, neglect, and, and other household challenges faced by families, reducing those ACEs by 15, sorry, 50, five zero percent within one generation. Next slide, please. So to achieve um, that bold goal, California's ACEs Aware initiative focuses on helping medical providers understand the importance of screening uh, for ACEs and ensuring that there is a trauma-informed, coordinated network of care that is ready to respond um, to ACEs that are detected. Next slide, please. So in Santa Cruz County, our Santa Cruz, our Santa Cruz County Public Health Department received a grant from the ACEs Aware Initiative um, to implement activities at a local level. Uh, and our county actually just received a second grant to do some assessment and planning work in concert with the grant we're working on now. Um, first five, our Health Improvement Partnership, Family and Children's Services, uh, as well as Stanford Children's Health, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, uh, and in particular, the folks that work in the specialty clinic uh, in Capitola, have all been collaborating over the past several months, building on existing partnerships and initiatives with the goal of strengthening and integrating medical, social, uh, and communities, uh, community level networks of care. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. So within that, First Five's role is to convene six network of care learning sessions to promote the ACEs Aware initiative, to share best practices, and to strengthen the coordination and collaboration among our network of care partners. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as many of you will recall in our first session held in November, the Center for Community Resilience or CCR introduced us to this concept of a pair of ACEs um, or adverse childhood experiences that occur within the context of adverse community environments. Um, in that session, we reflected on both the adversities in our community and what resilience or what a healthy tree um, would look like. And next slide, please. So in our second session held just last month, uh, CCR shared strategies for using policies as a tool for change at a systems level. Um, and we got inspired by the examples of collective impact and building partnerships across sectors that the Building Community Resilience Network in Oregon, my home state, uh, shared with us. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic session. Next slide, please. And so moving on to today, our topic is connecting ACEs, equity, and resilience. Uh, our goal for today's discussion is to provide really a foundational not set of knowledge of the roots of inequity and the resulting power dynamics that influence provider practice, the things that we do, um, and how people in our community receive and experience care. And so with that said, I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Maritza Lara, from the Health Improvement Partnership. Maritza is going to walk us through the agenda and introduce our guests from CCR. 
She will be sharing this information in Spanish and it will be interpreted into English. So Maritza, please. Thank you, David. Just to confirm, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, muchas gracias, David. Y buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Maritza Lara. Soy, uh, estoy con la Organización para el Mejoramiento de la Salud del Condado de Santa Cruz, o HEP por sus siglas en inglés. Si escuchan algún sonido atrás, es mi perra. Le encanta llorar en la mitad de las reuniones. Así que, así que bueno, manteniéndolo aquí realmente, la verdad. Este, soy directora de la Salud de Poblaciones en HEP. Y estoy muy agradecida por estar eh, con ustedes en esta tarde y ser parte de la serie de aprendizaje de la red de cuidados de ACES. Como pueden ver ustedes en nuestra agenda para hoy, estamos terminando con la bienvenida a este programa, la descripción general para esta reunión e introducciones. Pronto escucharemos sobre el Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria y su trabajo en trauma, equidad y resiliencia. Luego de escuchar al Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria, escucharemos las lecciones aprendidas de la Red de Construcción de Resiliencia Comunitaria. Después de esta presentación, tendremos la oportunidad de platicar y compartir nuestras propias perspectivas en grupos más pequeños. Tendremos grupos en español, así que allí espero verlos. Sí, uh, luego de conversar un poco en grupos pequeños, vamos a volver a esta sesión general y vamos a hablar un poco más. Va a haber tiempo para preguntas allí y luego terminaremos con delinear los siguientes pasos y la sesión de la clausura. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Como pueden uh, ver aquí, eh, este, voy a introducir a, a dos personas que van a hablar con nosotros. Eh, quiero presentarles a la doctora Wendy Ellis con el Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria. Dr. Ellis, can you wave so that people know who you are? Aquí vemos a Dr. Ellis uh, diciendo hola. Ella es profesora asistente en salud global y directora del Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria en la Escuela de Salud Pública del Instituto Milken de la Universidad George Washington. El Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria busca mejorar la salud de las comunidades al permitir que los socios interseccionales alineen las pólizas, los programas y las prácticas que corresponden a las experiencias adversas de la niñez, o ACEs por sus siglas en inglés, en el contexto de entornos comunitarios adversos, o como la doctora Ellis lo ha llamado, el par de ACEs en práctica. También hoy quiero uh, presentarles a, la, a Sara Baldauf. Sara, would you be able to wave? Allí está Sara uh, diciéndonos hola. Ella es una experta de comunicaciones del Centro para la Resiliencia Comunitaria y se ha desempeñado como miembro central del equipo de resiliencia comunitaria desde el 2016. En su rol, Sara fomenta un entendimiento compartido que es un componente clave en el desarrollo de coaliciones y resiliencia en las comunidades a través de un enfoque en la narración y la exploración de narrativas y poder. Sara ha sido fundamental en la creación de la de, y redacción y también de la edición de las herramientas y guías de recursos de CCR, incluida la guía de fomento de la equidad, la guía de pólizas y abogacía, y la guía de comunicación y construcción de coaliciones. Sara contribuye regularmente a los talleres de equidad dirigidos por CCR es un miembro del equipo del proyecto piloto Verdad y Reconciliación de CCR en Cincinnati y también apoya la planificación y el desarrollo estratégico del centro. Es de verdad para mí un gusto estar con ustedes, estar aquí con First Five, con, uh, en, en partnership con el condado de Santa Cruz también. Y especialmente estar con ustedes. Eh, ahora me gustaría cederle el tiempo a Wendy y a Sara para que uh, nos sigan llevando en, en la reunión. Gracias. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am going to start to share my screen. We are very excited to be able to share with you our work today. And um, I want to first off make sure you're going to have to coach me here. Um, let me know that you are actually seeing the full screen. If someone can nod and say yes. Okay, thank you so much. So um, let's dive right in because we have quite a bit that um, we want to share with you. So in addition to 
Sarah and myself being with you today. We're also joined by two of our partners, um, Vontrees McDowell from St. Louis, Missouri, and Joe Patterson from Washington, D.C. We're gonna talk about the work that they've done in their respective communities around ACEs, equity, and resilience, and the importance of really having lived experience, parents, and community voice um, to help us think through our efforts. So um, the Center for Community Resilience, the work that we do, we represent about uh, 14 different states, plus the uh, District of Columbia, and work the, the BCR work that is embedded in community with a number of different community organizations that work towards addressing childhood adversity, equity, and resilience. Um, this work is also invest, embedded in local health departments and our resilience catalyst work that is looking at it from a local health department perspective of how do we get upstream with community organizations as well as with other governmental ent entities to address the chronic adversity that's in our communities, particularly around ACEs, suicide, and opioid abuse. So the BCR work and the resilience catalyst work are just two pieces of the work that we do at the Center for Community Resilience. So today you're gonna to hear from our partners that are a part of the Building Community Resilience Collaborative, but that work, that collaborative actually fostered a whole other line of work around tools and resources to help foster equity, to foster shared understanding and conversations in community that get to very difficult issues around systemic racism and white supremacy to better understand what are the drivers of inequity in our communities so that we can foster equity to build resilient cities. So as you can see that um, and that icon there, it is a firm belief of our work that we can't be resilient if we are not addressing these systemic drivers of inequity. And so today that's where we're gonna spend a lot of our time is really thinking through how do we hold space for difficult conversations and how do we incorporate the voices of our patients, of our communities, of our children and the work that we do to both address childhood adversity, but really largely prevent it. Our work, as I mentioned before, the resilience catalyst work is another part of our work and that's with the local health departments. But ultimately, you know, the policy lab is the fourth arm of our work. And that's where we really focus on this long-term systems change. How do we change the policies that are driving the outcomes that we see? How do we inform legislation, whether that's at the federal level, at the state or the local level, and the advocacy work, the necessary advocacy work that's needed, particularly in your cases, at the local and state level to create levers for change. All of our work is based on the building community resilience process. That is this process that we introduced to the field in 2015 to help communities and organizations come together to address childhood adversity. So understanding that we have to create a shared understanding of what are the ACEs in our communities or in our practice or in our catchment areas if you're a school. And, and what's the narrative of that? To go beyond the data to really understand the lived experience of adversity. And then there's understanding, well, how well are we prepared to actually address the needs of the community? And that's this systematic uh, assessment of the state of readiness. Whether you as a provider are looking at and assessing your capacity or capability, or if you're part of a system, what is your system's capacity and capability of addressing the true needs of the community? What are those policy supports that are in place that we can leverage? Understanding that um, many times in the state of readiness, we realize either as a provider, I don't have the skill set, or I'm not connected to the right resource in order to address the needs of my community, well then we realize that we have to widen our tent, we have to build a bigger table. And that means that we have to make space for community uh, or cross sector partners. Most important in this process is the inclusion of community voice. Now I don't say this as the last part of it to mean that the community voice and incorporation of community voice is your third, fourth box that you check after you've done everything else. No, it's, it's informed in all of these steps. 
So you can't create a shared understanding of the of adversity in community if community is not at the table to tell you that story. You as a provider can't assess if you're effective or if you're capable of addressing what your community needs if you haven't had the input from your community, the feedback from your community. And you certainly can't build trust across cross-sector partners or build trust with community with these partners if community is not at the table. So yes, I'm beating a dead horse because community is important in every step of this. It's not just treating, observing and diagnosing what's happening in our community. It's being with the community voice at the table to really inform how will we treat, how will we diagnose, and most importantly, how will we address not only the hurt, but prevent the hurt in the first place. So because our work has been so based in community, that's why it became so necessary for us to go beyond just figuring out how we might be able to identify childhood adversity, but how are we stopping and preventing the adversity that's happening at the community level, the recognition of equity as a main driver of many of the adversities that our families experience, that many times that it is the disconnection, the fragmentation of our systems, the fragmentation of policies that produce the adverse community environments that we see that lead then to the adverse population health outcomes, that this glue as I said earlier, equity is the glue that holds it all together. And so how will we hold ourselves accountable by measuring equity and in order to have in the pursuit of community resilience? And that solution our community partners have found is in connecting the access to supports and buffers, but also at the same time, looking at policy, big P policy as well as small P policy. So earlier you saw a brief glimpse of the parabasis tree, and this is how we frame all of our work. So BCR is the process, but the parabasis tree is really essential to our work at framing what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Now this tree, the leaves and branches are the adverse childhood experiences as were defined by the original ACEs study. But we know that when we work with community, depending upon the community that we're working with, that adversity might not be in those 10 ACEs. You may have racism as the top adversity in a community. You may have the experience of the effects of climate change or pollution in your, in your community that is an adverse childhood experience. So again, because you have community voice in this process, that community voice is actually helping us to understand what is the experience of childhood adversity? What are those outcomes that are being experienced that we know will have a long-term effect on health and well-being if not addressed? But in order to assess what's on those leaves and branches and the health of those leaves and branches and what's driving that, you have to dig into the soil. And so that is the essential part of our work is going beneath the tree line, the root line, and understanding what's feeding the outcomes that we see whether that's poverty, discrimination, lack of opportunity to economic mobility or lack of social capital, violence, poor housing quality and affordability. These are the systemic drivers that oftentimes are coexisting with many of those things that we, have, we diagnose, whether that's in a doctor's office, in a classroom, in a clinician's office, we understand that they are often coupled. So that's why we use the parabasis tree to begin to zoom out, to understand not only what is the problem that we're trying to solve, but what is the context in which it's occurring. In 2020, it became very apparent for most who haven't already been involved in the equity work that at the root of many of the adversities that we see in our country is white supremacy. And I don't mean white supremacy in the sense of individuals with tiki torches or white robes, or even the people who raided the Capitol last month. No, what it is when we talk about white supremacy is the foundation for structural racism. So it is a belief in white supremacy. White people should dominate all other races. That is what built structural racism. 
It's those systems and policies that were designed to empower white supremacist belief that become a hard and durable infrastructure for producing white supremacy as an outcome. That white people dominate in power, wealth, health, and well being disproportionately and almost brutally so against all other races and ethnic groups. And we know from our practice and from our research that disproportionately it is our children of color who are suffering at the hands of structural racism in, as an infrastructure that they are going to under-resourced schools, living in poorer housing, parents that don't have access to economic mobility, suffering from food insecurity at disproportionate rates. So when we screen for ACEs, in large part, when we're serving communities of color, we are screening for the disproportionate impact of structural racism. That's the difficult topic that we will discuss today that helps you, will help you in your introduction of these new processes and approaches in community to really begin to think not only what's happened to my, our, our children and our community, but what is our role towards addressing systemic change? So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Baldoff, to continue this conversation. Sarah. Thank you, Wendy. Buenas tardes. Agradecemos la oportunidad de estar con ustedes hoy. Wendy just gave us very important framing to help us see how the cycle of white supremacy drives trauma, especially for communities of color in America. Next slide, please. And while the idea of white supremacy is based on a lie that white is superior or more valuable, data and lived experience show us its impact is tragically real. Countless generations of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and people of color have been forced to carry this burden. It is the American status quo. Today, I'll focus on narratives, <clears throat> excuse me, and power, how they uphold this cycle of white supremacy and trauma, and how communities' narratives and power are central to the process of equity, resilience, and Santa Cruz's bold goal of driving down ACEs by 50% in a generation. And we'll see what it looks like to engage in really center community, their expertise, wisdom, and already present strength and resilience. We'll also see how shifting and sharing power and lifting up communities' lived experiences and truths are critical to success and transformation. Next slide, please. So before we play this video, um, in talking about centering community and authentic engagement, I want you to hear the voices and the learnings from some of our Center for Community Resilience partners around the country. They're on the ground, innovating and doing this work to help shift power dynamics and reject dominant narratives and assumptions. They're changing status quo and the ways of operating with community at the center of the work. Could you play that please? Um, one thing I've always kind of told myself is that the power is already there with the people. Um, we have all, we have, created policy practices and procedures and institutions that have stripped away their power. I mean, made them believe they were powerless and, and, and therefore they're hopeless. As many in the BCR movement have learned, this perspective requires personal reflection as we consider our individual role in healing the hurt and creating opportunity to build equity and resilience. Through this work, we have come to understand that inequitable community conditions provide little access to supports or buffers that support the ability to bounce back and thrive. In trying to do something good can offend people. So I would caution, especially the people of dominant culture, <laughs> to be aware of that when, and to educate yourself and get some training and do some research. A lot of well communities in St. Louis and Kansas City have been working to improve equity by lifting up the community voice. They have found these voices to be essential in driving effective systems change, to close race-based inequity, 
we must examine all levels on which structural racism is propagated, consider our role in these systems, and commit ourselves to change. We're using the pair of aces to do that, to help them name what's in their soil and what's in their history that's keeping them from getting to well-being. An aspect of equity work is challenging our own assumptions, no matter our race, religion, gender, education, or economic status. I had to humble myself and check myself as a black woman and just say, okay, I'm showing up all wrong. First of all, I'm not saving anybody. I'm not working for anyone. I'm working with, these are the experts, and I'm actually here to learn before we can move forward with solutions. VCR teams are actively Thank you. So the reflections you just saw, these are examples of how we center community, not ourselves, not our organization or our good intentions. And that last speaker was Vontrice McDowell, who we'll get to hear more from today. She poses the essential question, how are we showing up? If we're going to ask permission to enter or engage a community that we are not part of, to ask for that opportunity to listen and learn, as Vaughn said, we need to challenge ourselves. These circles show the ways we can choose to show up. The default is staying comfortable, remaining passive, reacting instead of stopping to respond thoughtfully. That just serves the status quo. It reinforces the hierarchy and the structures of white supremacy. At the top of the clip, Chris talked about power in the community, how it's always been there, but how we've systematically stripped it away. Can we use our power to lift up that expertise and help build upon those community strengths? With humility and self-reflection, we can choose. When we're met with tension, anger or silence during a tough conversation? Do we react immediately and get defensive? Do we stay quiet and comfortable so it passes? Or can we pause and be in that uncomfortable moment and respond in a way that shows we see that person's pain or anger and respect their stories and what they've been through? Next slide, please. <clears throat> The news headline on the left highlights a common narrative of white supremacy. It reads, new survey finds many people don't believe systemic racism is a barrier to health. So the survey reflects the influence of the narratives that racism is not an issue on any large scale or systemic scale, or that the experiences of people of color are less important or less believable. However, we have plenty of data and stories of community experience to show us how race-based inequities, which are often driven by systemic racism in America, show up across sectors and impact health. The survey also suggests just how insidious this hierarchy of white supremacy and systemic racism can actually be, operating in plain sight without even being recognized by many of us. Now we'll play a video of Dr. Susan Moore an African-American doctor who spoke out from her hospital bed about the neglectful treatment she was getting because of her race, including being sent home inappropriately. Please play the clip. This is how black people get killed. When you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. She realized, because she, she was a physician, she realized that he was prejudging her. Thank you. Now, Dr. Moore spoke from her, from her hospital bed saying, this is how black people get killed when you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. Now she held her expert power 
She held expert power and used her medical knowledge. She herself was a trained medical doctor. She advocated for herself and she used her information power and her voice to share how she was being mistreated. But because she was a patient in a hospital bed, the doctors responsible for her care held the upper hand. There is an inherent doctor-patient power imbalance. And because of the color of her skin, as she explains in her videos, her pain and, and her expertise were dismissed. And she was sent home with a worsening condition. She knew all the well better that that should have not have medically been the case. Her doctor's expert and traditional power in that medical setting dominated. She was not listened to, she was discounted. And tragically, the final outcome was that she lost her life. And these are examples of the ways dominant narratives and power dynamics can drive trauma in health medical systems. But there are examples that can be found across all sectors and communities from education to housing to the justice system and beyond. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> in speaking of systems and the ways they can be a source of trauma, I, I'd like to look for a moment at the statement from a few weeks ago from the American Psychiatric Association. It is an apology to black indigenous and people of color for their support since the association's very beginnings long ago of structural racism, their support of structural racism. In the apology, they cite examples of harm they've caused, including quote, abusive treatment, experimentation, victimization in the name of quote, scientific evidence, along with racialized theories that attempted to confirm deficit status, end quote. The APA admits to the ways inequities in their practices still show up today. Uh, they use differing rates of schizophrenia diagnosis between white and patients of color as one example. Now this kind of detailed apology and full accounting is a critical start. It's an example of a massive system beginning with truth telling and self-reflection around, <clears throat> around the trauma it has caused. The APA, their work undoubtedly uh, remains significant, the work that remains to be done. But they are leading with truth and a real accounting. And without that beginning, healing and systems transformation is simply not possible. Next slide, please. Now, continuing on the theme of truth and accountability, I'd like to shift to an example from our Center for Community Resilience work in Washington, DC. The next clip features our, <coughs> excuse me, CCR's Harrison Newton. He's reflecting on a series of conversations that one of our social service partners, Martha's Table, was holding with community. Now, Martha's Table had moved not too long ago um, a brand new building into a new neighborhood uh, where they felt their services were more needed as gentrification is um, a significant force in Washington, DC. Now, Martha's Table um, and, the, and their new building and resources and services showed up in this new part of town and they wanted to deepen the relationships with the surrounding families and community. Please play it. Being able to hear community when people in community speak and, uh, and ask for that to be authentic comments with no strings, no preconditions, no uh, boundary lines around what we're here to talk about today. So that someone can say, well, what I'd like to talk about is how your organization failed me or my family or my neighborhood. Oh, wow, that wasn't what I wanted to engage you on today, but that's what you want to talk about. So now we're going to talk about that. And so I think it wasn't something that maybe Martha's Table had in their mind right at the outset, but it was certainly something that developed very quickly that if you're going to try to do authentic communication, you've got to let the community have the keys to that and take it, take it where they may want it to go. Because eventually you will you know, get to those things and those adversities or have the conversation you're wanting to have, but you can't have the conversation you wanna have until there's some level of trust. And that begins with listening uh, and, and, and someone trusting that, oh, when I talk 
they're listening and they're willing to even hear criticisms of what they do or who, who their organization is or what it's been up to. Thank you. Now, it's important to note uh, that a structural change that came out of those community conversations with Martha's Table was the creation of what they called the community pillar panel at Martha's Table. Uh, and that, that, that title came from community. Um, these, these folks, these individuals, the pillars of the community were known, um, are known for their legendary activism, organizing um, in the community and because they serve as literal pillars upholding the community and connecting the community, serving as buffers. Um, and a, 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 a huge example of, of the resilience that is right there in community. In recognizing that expertise and that power, Martha T Martha's Table created this structural mechanism uh, around their own strategy and decision-making. Uh, last slide, please. I like to end with this slide because it shows the key elements that are necessary in centering community that we've talked about. You'll notice that they all rest on humility. And those of us who operate as part of larger systems or organizations, um, or if we're seeking conversation or entry into a community we're not part of, no matter how good intention we may feel, we cannot expect access, entry, conversation, or trust without our own humility. And as Von Trees McDowell said earlier in, in one of the clips, community are the real experts. We are there to listen and learn, to understand the community's truths, their narratives as they tell them, and to share our own power with the structures and the systems that we work with to create real systems transformation with community at the center of that work. Thank you. Now, next, I'd like to introduce one of the community pillars that I mentioned from Martha's table. Uh, Joe Patterson is an incredible human who has um, been at the heart of systems change um, with and on behalf of community in Washington, DC. Um, she ha has, is a founder of Parent Watch Inc, an advocacy group that has worked for decades um, with parents and children to ensure their rights are protected. And these rights um, span all range of sectors and services. She works with education, with uh, Medicare, psychiatry, the DC Department of Youth and Rehabilitation Services, the DC Superior Court, advocating always for the best interests of children, youth, and families. Um, she is with us from Washington DC today, and she is also a key partner in the Washington DC Early Childhood Innovation Network, which is one of the BCR partners in DC. Joe, can you wave? I'm not seeing you, hopefully others can. And I'd also like to introduce Ms. Von Trees McDowell, who you saw there in one of the video clips. We're uh, lucky to have her with us as well. Um, she was with, in St. Louis, Alive and Well Communities, a BCR partner. She has moved on to a leadership role again with Invest STL uh, as a, um, a key, um, an expert in a community engagement. And she can talk about all range of experiences. I'd like to make sure we pick her brain about the ambassador program that she helped form and, and lead. Thank you, Vaughn. Um, Joe and Vaughn, I'm honored to be with these women. I'm always floored by their wisdom, um, their ability to work across community and different sectors, and really fundamentally their openness um, as women and leaders, as human beings. <clears throat> I'd like to start by asking you both, um, and I'd like this to be a sort of a free form conversation because I know that you two 
uh, operate well uh, off of e each other. Um, so we will not have it be formal, but I'd like to talk about and bring us back to the fact that um, we're here today because um, there is going to be mandatory screening for ACEs um, in California. And um, there is the bold goal of reducing ACEs by half, 50% in one generation. And I wanted to see if either of you have any initial thoughts or um, advice really to practitioners and community as California starts down that path. Um, I heard you first say mandatory. And so I'm wondering if it's the mandatory is for the providers or is it mandatory for the families? I just wanna ask that question because of the larger audience. And so even with that question, um, I'm just concerned about that because sometimes the clinicians and our providers, they look, they evaluate, they diagnose is the same for persons of color. Sometimes if you take 10 to 15 evaluations and white out the name of especially black boys and people of color, the content is the same. And so sometimes it's prejudged by neighborhood, prejudged by the particular uh, individual is Medicaid and not uh, Care First or Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the mislabeling, mislabeling and the misdiagnosis of our um, communities and people of color, it's, it's very assumed, very prejudged. And so I, I just pray that when providers and clinicians, if they could establish a network with the natural and informal resources or first responders, uh, uh, the communities or the persons that families trust that they talk to, that they begin to integrate and work with the natural and informal resources and persons that are on the ground. So their definition and how they define and how they diagnose and how they interact with families of color, that it would be more um, received better as they document our uh, families. Um, I think Ms. Joe uh, opened up the right way. Uh, <laughs> mandatory for whom? Um, are, are, we, <laughs> are we all being screened? So providers just like our clients, right? Because um, in my work at Alive and Well, when we're building this awareness around trauma, we're doing that to help folks understand why they show up the way they do. And that includes not just the folks we serve, but also the folks providing the service, right? And so when we think about the doctor's story that you all shared, I almost couldn't watch it, but I leaned in, right? When we think about that story, there was something in her provider's heart. We're not, we're gonna move beyond mind. There was something in her provider's heart that impacted how he or she or how they treated her and serviced her. And so that those things can come out through an ACE uh, screening, but it can't just be for the folks that we serve. The other question that came to mind immediately, well, first let me say that it's a bold goal. I think it's a beautiful goal, right? Just because we're having this conversation doesn't mean we pause and don't do it. But I challenge um, those of you who created the goal to ask yourself why? Why do we want to do this, right? I think that's really important. And the other thing is when we do a screening, right? We're opening up Pandora's box, right? That means if I am your client and you're screening me, you may, and I saw folks in the chat saying at what age, right? You can do it at my age, right? 37 years old and you asked me to fill out that a screening I am going to recall some things that I have tried to bury and forget for a very long time. 
So then the question becomes, are the supports in place? Are the supports in place for those folks that we are screening? And then are our institutions, um, and Troy, you opened it up in the chat, are our institutions ready to really admit that they have perpetuated some of this trauma that our folks have experienced and what work are our institutions going to do to better support the folks that we're going to screen? So those are just a few immediate thoughts that came to mind for me, Sarah. But um, Sarah, can I just pick back just a little bit, especially thank you so much, Vaughn, for uh, uh, weighing in on actually the ACEs and how our providers are going to perceive that. Because it can't just be a cliche of new verbiage, you know, and, uh, trauma-informal care, um, adverse. Do you truly, the real question is, do you truly understand what communities are going through and what effect that clinics and systems and hospitals and human services have failed a community? So we have to also make sure that who practice the ACEs, that they are equipped with tooling and skilling in terms of working with that target population without prejudgment. Can I jump in here for a second? First off, I just love being in the same room with Joe and Von Trees again. But Joe, what you were talking about when you said the trauma-informed care kind of goes back to our first session about the importance of partnering with community, of engaging parent voice in um, both in the screening process, like how we go about doing this, but how do we arrive at our decisions on what a case management or care plan would look like. So instead of just saying being trauma informed, perhaps we need to put community informed and, and community in front of that and it's community trauma informed care. And what might that look like? What would that process look like? Because I know that's very much some of the work that you've done with the Early Childhood Innovation Network here in DC. Um, one of the things is cultural humility and to begin to not always view um, your patients or your community uh, target population as always lived experience because we all have lived experience. We all have the same traumas that this target population have, but the difference is we have resources and we have connections to elite resources or persons that can help us guide. So that cultural humility begins with us recognizing and also experiencing and taking the field, just like a resident, you know, a doctor go and do a residency. It should be the same thing with the clinicians. We also have decades in history of stigma around mental health in, in, the, in the community of color. So all of those things have to be registered as you look at ACEs. And as you, as you always say with the BCR, the resilience, you know, how just remember going back to when we weren't allowed to go to the hospitals. I remember Washington DC, we only were allowed to go to Freeman's Hospital. So how did we survive? And so you have to remember families, how, our community, how do we begin to begin to, to trust the medical institutions? Because when we go in there, just as doctor, I believe it was Dr. Moore or the doctor that just, just passed, elite. The same way when I worked in Neiman Marcus, black customers will come in and security will follow them. So it's, that's what we have to begin to look at. Cultural humility, not looking at every um, um, target population that we work with, they come in that room. Oh, it's the same as Mary, they just left. I can just use the same approach because she got two kids, she on drugs. And the other thing with ACEs, we have to make sure that we're prepared. A lot of us have to mandate to report. And when a family wants to dump and say, oh, Wendy, look, I, can, I, I, I smoke weed every now and then. And then you pick the phone up and when she gets home, CFSA is at her door. 
So we have to begin to look at all of those dynamics of the target population that y'all getting ready to work with. They should be prepared that if I come in with some smelling liquor on my breath, don't call the police, okay? Because you already know what exists in my communities. You already know the issues of families. You have mothers that have five and 10 kids. So we have to condition ourselves. That's what I mean by the cultural humility. This, this word cultural competence has nothing to do with the color of the skin. We have to look at the, the value and what that, that particular client or, or group of target population you're gonna work with. You have to be knowledgeable about what you're dealing with. And Sarah, can I add, and we, we, and we know, right, from the ACE research that the higher your ACE score, the higher your likelihood of dealing with substance abuse and alcoholism, right? So if we understand that, then we should not be judging, right? That should inform how we engage. But the last piece I would add around um, the mandatory screening is what education is going to be provided to the community before you begin screening. What are you screening me for? What is an ACE? What is trauma, right? And don't assume because I'm living it, I know what it is. That's right. Don't assume that. So I think that piece is extremely important. I would love for you to speak a yeah. little bit. Oh, well, before that, I think it's important we make a clar clarification though. And Nicole has pointed it out in the chat that this is not about mandatory screening, but rather it is that the, the Medi-Cal improve the supports for um, training and, um, and building trauma-informed networks um, in order to, I mean, to the pursuit of reducing ACEs. That will mean though, it doesn't mean, you know, screening per se, but that means like enhanced perhaps interview techniques where we can encourage individuals mm -hmm. to share their trauma history. So while it's not mandatory screening, I do believe that you're right, Joe, to make the point about how we prejudge individuals based upon how they present in, in practice, how they might share a trauma history that would fall into, say, an ACEs screening, but, um, but the understanding that we can't prejudge these, uh, you know, our patients and, and individuals, the community that we serve. But I just want to make sure that um, you know, because in the BCR network, we all have, as you all might have figured out, we have some very strong emotions around the idea of mandatory screening. Um, as, as Sarah pointed out on that list, and that comes from history. That comes from, you know, this reductionist approach to finding deficiencies in communities of color and reducing our children, reducing our families down to an index point. And so, you know, certainly the ACEs screener would make that extremely efficient to be able to say that's a one and let's sort them this way or an eight, let's sort them that way. Um, and so, but I just wanna make that point that it's not mandatory, but there is a slippery slope here. Um, if we're not, you know, hu hu have some humility and have an understanding of the nuances around some of the stories, the, the experience that's going on in community and our approaches. If I could, I know I, that, Joe and Vaughn, we've talked a little bit recently. Um, I'm reminded of our conversations around coronavirus vaccines and the efforts on the part of uh, public health and other, uh, you know, medical systems to, you know, get to, you know, the, those folks who are hesitant. And, you know, you know, we've talked about gatekeepers and we've talked about what it would mean um, to suggest to, a, to communities who've experienced historical trauma, especially around medicine and the medical experience, what that, what that really means when someone from a big system comes to you and says, you have to get this, it will save you, your family, et cetera. Uh, Vaughn, you mentioned something the other day about your work in this and some, some places where you've pressed time out and said, here's what I'm willing to help with and this is what it looks like. Right. Yeah, um, so in my, well, it's, it's Nixon for our nine to five, but who has a nine to five anyway, whatever. We don't have a nine to five. <laughs> but one of the tables that I have the privilege of sitting at 
is called Prepare STL, really close to my nine to five, but it's different. Um, we are a group of community organizers, funders, the health department, um, EDs, nonprofits in St. Louis that decided to organize last March to um, be proactive in how we uh, engaged our community, specifically the black community, because we knew from history that our community here in St. Louis would be disproportionately impacted by COVID. We knew it, right? Uh, we knew that our community would not receive the PPE that it would need. We just knew. And the numbers started to come out and the death rate uh, was extremely high and it was high among African-Americans and uh, black folks in St. Louis in our um, zip code. And so now we've transitioned, we're still messaging and doing outreach and work around COVID, right? But now you have the vaccine and you do have the health department, right? Which is one of our partners that has reached out and asked, would you be willing, would you be interested and being part of this campaign to convince African-Americans and black folks to get vaccinated. And our response was no. And our response was no because we decided, and we are a group of very diverse opinions around the vaccine. I'm fully transparent. I get the flu vaccine every year. If I wasn't expecting right now, I would probably consider getting the COVID vaccine. My husband's on a different page, right? So we have diverse opinions within our group. And so what we decided was that we are not here to convince black folks to get vaccinated, but we are here to inform our people and share all of the knowledge that we have around COVID, around the vaccine, around the resources, the places you can go, but also around building immunity, which gets us to the social determinants of health. It is right. not, so we have doctors on our team as well. And it's not just about the vaccine. If we don't address our diet, right? If we don't address our stress, which comes right from these adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments, we can still get sick, right? When we're thinking about this resilience concept. So our job is to share all of the information that we have and also get questions from our community and take it back to these institutions. So you want to vaccinate us, but can you answer our questions first? And then furthermore, can you recognize the historical trauma that we have experienced at the hands of the medical profession, right? And so that is the role that we decided to play as the organizing body at Prepare STL. And I think it's a clear example of how you can use your power and your influence to advocate. You have to be very careful though that gatekeeper term makes me very uncomfortable, but there are folks that are going to elevate you as a gatekeeper because lack of a better term, for me, I might be viewed as that, that safe Negro, right? That they can have a conversation with and I won't get angry, right? And, if, and I'll, I'll take that, I'll sit at your table, but my job is to operate in integrity and be very honest with you and let you know where my people are. And if you ever want to interview them, you ever want to talk to them, you also, one of the things that Sarah and Ms. Joe and I talked about, you need to come prepared to pay because you're going to get money and you're going to benefit from this research and engaging them and trying to vaccinate them. But how will our community, community benefit from your work. So that was a um, very long answer, but a conversation that we had around the vaccine and um, how we kind of serve as a liaison and trying to bring our community together with the institution um, to kind of have a more honest conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Joe, I, I, I'd love for you to pick up on that thread that Vaughn perfectly dropped for us. <laughs> we talked about currency the other day, you know, and then we talked about cash and we talked about real re real compensation. Um, because a lot of times when um, groups or institutions go uh, to try to get community input, um, many times it becomes check the box, but you very spoke very 
well and specifically about knowing the grant writing process, knowing about the deliverables that uh, folks who get these grants um, you know, need to show and prove that they've achieved and how are they achieving those things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And, and Vaughn, you brought little tears in my eyes. I mean, that was so well said. But with, with, with a, a, this beginning point, every community has a structure. Every community has an enormous amount of natural and informal resources that exist right into their community. And so when we talk about the currency of coming into communities. I read a proposal, I, I read a grant, and you see in the grant, we're going to target disparity, the vulnerable, um, trauma, substance abuse. And I do not understand right today when, when these institutions write these grants that they don't begin to just look at a simple basic thing that, oh my God, I'm writing about a human being's problems and I'm getting money to help them fix their problems. But then you don't wanna be inclusive enough to include them in the budget, in the, in the process. And this is where, when we say the pandemic, and, and I get so tickled because the community teaches you so much. They say, oh, the pandemic, the corona. They be saying, look, Ms. Patterson, look, I'll come to the workshop. You say so, blah, blah, blah. But we're in pandemic all the time. We're in struggles all the time. We live off of uh, uh, $228, four and five kids. So... Until we begin, especially with our institutional, intellectual learn privilege, when we begin to realize that all the wealth that we learn institutionalize, that if we can begin to stand beside a person that can give deliverables, can sit and talk fluently just as well as all of us are. Why, what is so insecure about the documented degree that you can't recognize that person can do outcomes and deliverables? And guess what? Whatever uh, they can't do, you compliment that. You know, and I learned this in the late 70s, when I worked at the Washington School of Psychiatry, Dr. John Dillingham, he's passed on. And we were getting this grant around first offenders. Uh, he, he did the Terrence Johnson um, therapy case. And I was like, oh, Dr. Dillingham, I can't write that. He says, Joe, listen, what you do, you go each area and you write the point. But the most important thing that I learned from him and we learned from each other, he said, I guess what, Joe? When we walk in this room, if they like me, I got you. If they like you, then you get me. And that's how we have to begin to work. We have to use that triage approach like with our Eason team in Washington, DC. There, there's no eyes. And so, the other thing we have to recognize is the pandemic and the COVID and the corona possibly we might be strange to y'all, but it's some of these traumas that y'all think are trauma to our community. It's like a norm. It's like a normalcy. You know, every day we have to get up and figure out. We don't have the privilege to think about, oh, if we're going to get corona, oh, if we're going to get COVID. And something that Vaughn said about the hygiene, the mask, I just, when this came on, I immediately just thought about my community. How would they just get those tools to prevent? Not so much as the virus, but the prevention. So those are some of the things that we have to look at that are just natural and informal. 
and they, they tickle me. They say, I'll just take some garlic and cayenne and lemon water. And, and we have to also recognize their alternatives and how they want to be healed as a part of this process too. I don't know how much time we have, but I wanted to pick up on a statement that was made in the chat. Do we have time? So there was someone who um, stated in the chat about the intergenerational trauma and how that becomes the norm. And one of the things that it reminded me of um, is Vaughn's work in community around um, the equity champions, but also the, 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 the folks that work on the front line to, to really educate community about trauma themselves. And yeah. so I think that, um, you know, and this has been a theme of our work here in Washington, DC, is that the traumatized, especially from generation to generation, they don't even realize they're traumatized. So, um, you know, how do we begin to normalize that conversation uh, with community voice so that, you know, while it is a regular and almost predictable experience of uh, being exposed to trauma, it should never be normalized. That's right. That is so right. So Vaughn, can you talk about some of the work that you've done in St. Louis? that has actually empowered community to begin to recognize traumas within? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when I got to Alive and Well, one of their main <clears throat> goals was working with our institutions, our healthcare centers, our federally qualified health centers, and our schools um, on their journey to becoming trauma-informed. But what I noticed was that we weren't really engaging the folks that those institutions were serving, right? And so I was asked to just come up with a community engagement plan. And I, I knew what that meant. On, on, in our neck of the woods in St. Louis, that meant come up with a way to go talk to the Black people, right? So that was in my area. And um, after going through the trainings myself, the A study was so powerful for me personally in helping me to understand why I was showing up the way I was showing up. And I think I just got energized and was like, man, I want to share this with as many people as possible. But what I had to realize is that I am born and raised on the south side of Chicago. So I'm a transplant in St. Louis. And I recognize and I respect that I'm, still, I'm a guest, right? And so if I want to reach folks in our region, I need to connect with folks that they will trust. So we um, developed a community engagement model um, from our traditional institutional curriculum, and we called it the Community Empowerment Workshop. And we hired and trained residents throughout St. Louis City and St. Louis County to be able to deliver this curriculum. And it has the same messaging, it has the same science, but it's packaged and delivered in a more digestible, relatable way. The examples are extremely relatable and connected to the neighborhoods where these facilitators live and where they came from. And so they helped us to identify where we should go with the workshop. They organized the workshop and they delivered the workshop. Most importantly, we paid them. $35 an hour is all that we could afford. It might sound like a lot, but it's never enough if you ask me, but we were able to pay them for their work. Um, I think what uh, is really powerful about that is that you, again, like Wendy said, it's not normal, but sometimes we just don't have the language to put to what we're going through. And sometimes we don't even give ourselves grace and empathy when we show up angry and we show up frustrated or our client might come into the office cursing or you call them on the phone and they hang up on you and you're wondering why they're so rude, quote unquote, why they're so ignorant or why they're so mad. But if they're going through what we see on that pair of ACES tree and what Ms. Joe said, that many of the folks that we're working with are in a constant state of crisis before COVID. They were in a constant state of crisis. And if we really lean into the ACE study, we know what that trauma and toxic stress does to our brain, 
does to our connection and does to our behavior. And so we were able to build this understanding at the neighborhood level and folks were kind of starting to have empathy, not just for themselves, for their children, for their partners, for their neighbors, right? And then the folks that were delivering this curriculum went on to do so many other things. One of the young ladies ran for office in her municipality. She's a councilwoman and just got hired to work um, for uh, Cori Bush. So it's just, it could be very empowering, but I would like to say that the messenger matters. Yes. And how we deliver the message absolutely matters. Some of us could get really uncomfortable with, oh my God, you want me to tell people about their trauma. It may not be you. You might not be the one that needs to talk to people about their trauma, but who is the right person? It may be you to help kind of organize the process, but the messenger and the message is extremely important. Um, Wendy, when you asked that question, I thought about uh, under the Obama administration when they created the mental health first aid. And that came from exactly what Ms. Vaughn is saying about who can be that person that they trust to talk about it. Sometimes there's a process even before they get to the clinician or mental health services where they speak to that trusting tunnel. And so when they created the mental health first aid, those are other descriptions, um, Wendy, that can demonstrate how we can look at this ACEs approach, how we can create those trusting tunnels that our community respect, that can work collectively or have one assigned within a clinic that that person can go and speak to that trusting tunnel to deescalate, as um, Ms. Vaughn said about they come in angry. And a lot of times the verbiage they use is because they don't know how to say to you what their real issues are. Because I've had families say, look, I don't need no medicine. I just need to pay my rent. And, and, and it, it, all of those things are what our clinicians and those service providers have to be prepared to to put in their whole mind as they work with this population, that they don't see it. They see it as stigma. You want to put me on medicine and you want me to lose, but you're not really getting to the root of my problem. And that's not prejudging the clinics or the physicians or the doctors, is that you got to partner again with these natural and informal resources that these particular communities and this target population that y'all want to work with. Thank you both so much. I, I want to be sensitive to time because I also really want to be able to uh, do our breakout room sessions okay. with you all. We are going to come back together after the separate breakout sessions. So we will have a chance to have these brilliant minds back on, on the topics <laughs> after we, we chat. Uh, again, these the breakout rooms are not going to be recorded. So we will be able to hopefully have some intimate conversations and um, learn from one another. So um, my understanding, Nicole, is that we have two choices. Um, uh, group one, uh, providers that are serving the community. Wendy and Miss Jo Patterson will be in that breakout room. So if you want to learn more from them, um, please join group one for providers. Group two, uh, Ms. Von Trees will be leading there. I'll be supporting um, this is more uh, for folks, uh, parents, caregivers, community members. That's going to be the focus of the group two breakout session. Um, and I, I believe Nicole and Nicole, there should be a link to join the provider group. Yeah, we'll, sh we'll show that in a minute. Sarah, do you want to say a little bit more about what they're going to discuss yes. in each of the breakouts? Yes. Um, both groups, we are going to talk about, um, again, coming back to power and narratives and how we shift power and really upend and shuffle uh, some of the status quo structures that we have that are operating. Um, narratives, we 
talked about that. Uh, Joe and Vaughn talked about it as well and kind of taking off the white coat and being, you know, really going, uh, going for the humility, the cultural humility. Um, both uh, of these women have a lot of experience. Joe ended there on a really important point around clinicians um, and the experience of uh, people, you know, in stigma and how do you shift um, practice to actually serve people and be able to communicate well and um, the community. So Sarah, Sorry. would it be helpful, if, or Nicole, would it be helpful if I just give the specific questions for each one of the groups and then they, they can kind of make a decision from there to kind of get sure. an idea of how yep. the conversation is being framed. Mm -hmm. So group one, that will be myself and Joe, um, we're going to really, you know, and someone asked, is that healthcare providers or all providers? So we're, we're, we are defining providers very loosely, but those that are going to be working with community, just so that helps a little bit. Um, and, you know, a, a free form conversation, pick Joe's brain, pick my brain, talk amongst ourselves on, around what specific assumptions or narratives might exist that would influence the way that you show up when you are screening for or treating some sort of adversity that you that comes across in your patient interaction or client interaction, you know, and so that's the, the framing for the first one. Um, the second group is Sarah and and um, Von Trees, and it's really um, you know parents, caregivers, community members to think through you know as as we move through this program of the Aces Aware and the goals are there are there um, you know as are there certain community narratives from your perspective or experiences that get shut out or ignored. Um, and how does that impact your care experience, your service delivery, um, and do provider, what do providers need to know, understand, and respect? So that's just the beginnings of it, but that's sort of like how we're framing it for one from a service delivery um, perspective with community, the other one from a community perspective of understanding. And it's hopeful that when we come back together, we'll be able to share these perspectives for what for you will be the beginnings of thinking how you use this information in this transformation time. Is that yeah, helpful? <laughs> yes, thank you, Wendy. Um, and we'll have these <clears throat> norms for conversation to try to create a safe space that we can actually have some deeper conversation. Yeah. We're gonna use I statements. It's about what you think and feel, not about your perceptions of others. Sharing airtime, uh, speak, please but also no one to land the plane. Um, listen to understand, not just to respond. So we're really, we're, we're going in with the intention to learn. Also, please take risks, uh, ask questions. There, there, you know, we don't have wrong, wrong uh, there are no wrong questions to ask here. We do ask, uh, it's very important to honor confidentiality, around, especially around these, these topics. Uh, really only take your words with you and this last one here is ouch, then educate. If there is something that is said that you uh, does not sit well with you, is offensive, um, acknowledge it and, and educate that person as to why uh, it's harmful. Thank you. Okay, so here's the information. Um, if you are wanting to join the service provider group, um, you're actually going to need to click on a link that I'm putting in the chat right now. Um, so it's going to tell you or, or ask you if you're if you really want to leave this meeting and you should say yes. <laughs> so you're going to click on a button that says um, leave this meeting and join the new meeting, which will basically be your breakout group. Um, so you can just click the link that's in the chat and it should take you right there and Nicole Lesson will be there waiting for you. Um, along with, um, we have other interpreters. So Oscar, you can go ahead and, and go to group one. Um, everybody else that wants to participate in the group for parents, caregivers, and community members, you're going to stay in this room. So you don't have to click anything. We'll just hang out for a minute while everybody else, uh, to make sure everybody else gets to the group that they wanted to go to. Wendy, I, I yield to you, Dr. Ellis. <laughs> All right. 
I, I, I'm going to yield to Dr. Patterson, the, the honorary <laughs> Dr. Patterson, <laughs> um, who was doing some real magic in our group around, um, and of course, tears were shed because when Joe and now we know Elaine are in the room, that's what's going to happen. Um, but these are all, to, you know, tears on behalf of our communities. Um, I, I mean, you know, what really came out for us is, you know, how are we not only going to work with community, but how do we work with other systems? How do we work up against the public narrative and really the power dynamics that, um, that really not only perpetuate adversity, but stand in the way of being able to have an equitable access to the resources, the assets, the supports and buffers that our communities need. And um, I, I hope, Elaine, you don't mind me kind of raising up, but I think, you know, Elaine made a really good point mm -hmm. that it, while it's poignant in her regard, very specific, I don't think that that's, that she's alone and what she's experiencing. And Elaine, do you want to share a little bit about what you shared with us? Okay, sure. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> here I am. <laughs> um, so what I was sharing is that, you know, um, when I grew up in my profession, I got to work in a community that was extremely diverse, um, you know, socially, economically, um, educationally, all of that. Uh, there was just such a myriad of people that um, got to heal together and, um, you know, we got to really be about community there. Um, and then I, um, what do you call it when you retired? <laughs> and, you know, I'm taking all of my knowledge and growth and all that stuff and coming to my new community um, and it's very homogenized and, um, and there's a, um, there's a nimbyism that, um, pushes away. But what my thing was, was, you know, what I bring there is my own judgment about my new community, right? And, you know, um, how is that getting in the way of me being effective too? So, um, but it really does break my heart that, you know, we have this huge problem and we can't even get a foothold for my organization to be able to even do our work. So um, when I talk about it, it's, uh, it makes me kind of sick to my stomach. <laughs> and, um, it does, it really does break my heart. And um, all we want to do is be of service to our community. So uh, there's kind of a lot of unpacking to do with that. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want my own thinking and judgments to get in the way of moving forward into this community either. So, you know, that's that other caveat. Thank you, Elaine. So I know we only have 12 minutes left. I do want to give an opportunity for Sarah and Vaughn to weigh in. Miss Vaughn. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy. Well, first of all, I'm glad that Joe's group cried. I'm the crybaby. <laughs> But I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> um, we had, we ended our group with a question around power. And so I want to leave this group with that question. Um, and I, and not for you to answer right now, but to think about, and someone put in the chat, which I thought was very powerful, that there also needs to be a cultural conversation around kind of like the interpretation and understanding of that word power, because um, it could feel icky to some of us because of how we've seen people abuse their power. But my question um, to the entire group is 
do you have power? Do you have influence? My answer is yes, absolutely. But then the other question is, how do we tap into that? Elizabeth shared a beautiful story. Elizabeth, I won't you know, share your story, but I will say that what I took away from it is also too, how do we advocate for one another? And if we feel like you were brave in that moment, in that story um, that you shared, and you stepped up for someone who did not feel comfortable um, speaking for themselves. And so when do we do that? How do we do that? I would say pick and choose your battle because as Elaine said, it's a lot going on. It is a whole lot going on and we will get sick. We will get tired. We will get burned out if we try to fight all of them. Um, Elaine, what I wrote down listening to you was bias, biases, which we all have. We all have them. I share my stories about the ones that I carry with me all the time. And um, what do we do to address them? Um, those of us that actually might be afraid to step into their power and also their privilege, right? One thing that I don't think we've mentioned is white privilege. Um, and I know folks get uncomfortable with that term. But if you have power and privilege, I'm not mentioning it for you to be afraid of it, but I would challenge you to ask yourself, what are you doing with it? Elizabeth exercised that power and that influence in the store for a complete strength, right? So what are you doing uh, with it? And I think if you feel like you don't have it, I think for me, I'll use my eye voice, that I begin to recognize that I have power when I begin to learn my history and when I begin to learn the history of this country and how it has tried to uh, strip me and my people, thinking about Chris's video, of our power um, in very systemic and structural, very intentional ways. And that level of understanding let me know you wouldn't try to take something if you didn't think I had it. And if you think I have it, hell, then I believe I have it too. Um, and like for my brown brothers and sisters, I just think about, I, I'm not super familiar with your history. I'm not gonna pretend to be. But what I see in the news and the things that I hear about building a wall and the narrative that is created, see here come the tears, around my brown brothers and sisters, right? Let's speak it into the atmosphere that my brown brothers and sisters are raping and that they're coming over here to take my job, right? That is to instill fear in me. That is to divide us, right? And I've seen that before, right? With Jim Crow and post-slavery. They said the same thing about my black men. If I didn't know that history, I wouldn't be able to recognize that racism and that ignorance and that game when I see it today. And so that has really helped me um, to recognize that we all have some sort of power. Otherwise, these narratives wouldn't be created. Um, the foolishness that we see right now is because black and brown folks are starting to step in to their power, they starting to vote. They're starting to say that they wanna see change and they wanna see themselves in office. And when you start to disrupt and start messing with people's power and privilege, they get mad. So January 6th should be a clear example that everyone on this call has power. So that's the, that's, that's why I leave it before I start crying even more. <laughs> I'm going to leave it up to the organizers to pick up from here. Thank you all for us sharing today. Joe, Von Trees, Sarah, um, from the bottom of our hearts at the Center for Community Resilience, it has really been an honor to be able to partner with you all these last three sessions. All of our tools and resources are free, open. You can come download them 
on our off of our website and we really truly wish the best for you we are in the trenches with you and um godspeed so thank you thank you wendy and you know, this these last three sessions that we have been able to do with you i think each one has been so valuable and, and provided a great opportunity for um, people from all different, you know, kind of sectors and areas of our community to come together. We even have um, people from some of our neighboring counties participating too. So it really starts to build not just a sense of community in, <clears throat> in terms of what are we going to do in Santa Cruz County, but regionally. So um, this has been a really wonderful uh, way to be able to build those kinds of and strengthen those kinds of relationships and partnerships. Um, and the tools that are available through um, the Center for Community Resilience or your uh, Building Community Resilience kind of set of, of tools. I know that we're really looking forward to continuing our conversations locally about, okay, what, how do we use this? How do we um, really harness the collective power that we all have that to me in, our, in the group that we just had with parents and community members, like you could just feel the emotion and the passion and the um, and the willingness to get to work together. And so I, I think that just leaves us in a really good place to continue these conversations. Um, so for those of you that have been participating in these ACEs Aware learning sessions with us, um, we're, we're glad that you keep coming back. We still have three more at least that we have planned, um, starting with our topic for next month where before we kind of shift focus and, and, and focus on other topics, we actually wanna spend more time having discussions like we did today um, um, you know, with each other about you know, what does community resilience look like in our community? You know, what is in our soil and, and what kind of um, strategies and, and relationships and advocacy do we need to change um, policies, change systems, change our practices, again, all in the name of addressing and preventing adversity. So um, we have the registration is just opened for that March 11th session. It'll be the same time, same kind of uh, similar format as today. Uh, and then April, we have, we've um, identified the date and a topic. We're gonna do some more specific conversations about building and strengthening our network connections. Um, there are some fairly new tools that are becoming available that some of you may have heard about, like Unite Us, which is a, a technology platform that facilitates communication and referrals you know, in order to coordinate uh, communication and, and resources and services for community members. And then in June, we actually, uh, I think previously have said that the, the last session would happen either in May or June. So we've decided June, we don't have a date yet, but that's gonna be a, a community conversation that we co-host with the Health Improvement Partnership, which is also doing quite a bit of uh, specific work with medical providers around how to incorporate ACEs screenings into their clinics and into their practice. So we're gonna have a, a, a facilitated conversation co-hosted with HIP um, that's yet to be planned, but we will certainly let you all know when that's coming up. And, um, I think our last request for all of you is not only to register for the upcoming sessions, but to um, give us feedback about today's session. So you can either, I'm gonna post the links in the chat for the survey and the registration. We would love to get your feedback about today's session, either in English or Spanish. You can either click the link in the chat that I just posted, or if you have a smartphone and wanna hold it up to the QR code, you can scan it. Uh, we would really love to know what you thought about today's session and how we can continue building on this. And the portions of today's session that we recorded and um, some of the resources that were shared beforehand, we'll compile all of those and send them out again to everybody that registered. Uh, it'll probably take us about a week to be able to do all of that. 
But that is, I think, it for today. We really enjoy being and gathering with all of you. And so again, thank you so much for, for being part of our, our learning process. Thank you, and Wendy and Sarah and Bontrice and Joe, it really was a, a pleasure to, to get to talk with you and hear your experiences and, and your advice. Very, really. very valuable. And I just want to thank you all for loving on me. <laughs> and thank you. That's encouragement. I really appreciate it. That's resilience, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm looking forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Leaders and interpreters. Bye.